The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Thank you for uh, coming to our uh, first spring breakfast, and it really is spring today uh, as the fog uh, dissipates. Uh, while you were having coffee this morning, uh, you may, may have noticed the city harvest table that was uh, set up in the uh, reception area promoting Skip Lunch Fight Hunger initiative. Uh, the uh, City Harvest Skip Lunch program uh, encourages people to no donate what they would normally spend on lunch to help fight uh, hunger in New York City. Last year's event raised over half a million dollars. City Harvest is currently looking for sponsors and support. Uh, we hope that you consider joining the Skip Lunch effort at your office. Uh, the City Harvest bags are at your table this morning, so please help uh, if you can. Uh, it'll also help you be able to get into shape for, uh, for spring and summer. It is now my pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, New York State's Attorney General Eric T. Schneiderman to Abney. Eric was elected the 65th Attorney General of New York on November 2nd, 2010. As Attorney General, Eric is the highest ranking law enforcement officer for the state, responsible for representing New York and its residents in legal matters. Eric has worked to restore the public's faith in, its, in the public and private sector institutions by focusing on public integrity, economic justice, social justice, and environmental protection. Eric brings a wealth of experience to his position in both public and private sec sector. Before becoming AG, uh, Eric served as the leading reformer in the New York State Senate, where he helped pass a sweeping ethics reform package, chaired the committee to expel a corrupt senator for the first time in modern history, and passed the toughest law in the nation to root out fraud against taxpayers. Before joining the State Senate, Eric spent 15 years in private practice as an attorney, and later as a partner with the firm of Kirkland and Lockhart. Mr. Attorney General, welcome to Abney. Today marks your 116th day uh, as Attorney General, and all of us are eager to hear about what you have done and what you are looking to do as you move forward into 2011 and for the rest of your term. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor, and I was talking with Bill, we are either right after or right before the 40th anniversary of the original Power Breakfast, and we should figure out when it is, because uh, maybe we could do something different to celebrate, like move this to lunch. Uh, uh, but reflecting on that and thinking back to the 40 years that Abney has been meeting and convening and uh, cooking up ideas and harassing elected officials and making sure we do our jobs better than we otherwise would. It's important to remember that when Abney was formed in the early 1970s, New York City was facing a crisis that actually was far worse than the one we face today. Crime was going up, income was go incomes were going down, unemployment was going up and tax revenues were going down. And we really have Lou Rudin and the other founders of Abney to thank for a lot of good reforms, a lot of innovations, and especially for launching the conversation about how to make New York even better that continues today. And I thank you, Bill. I'm truly honored to have been invited to participate in that conversation. For the last two years, I've been traveling around the state of New York as a candidate and then as a new AG visiting my regional offices. And I've spoken with literally thousands of New Yorkers who have shared lots of things with me. When you're a candidate, you're like a walking focus group. People share sometimes more than you'd like them to share, but they talk a lot about what's on their minds. So I've been spending a lot of time hearing what's on the minds of New Yorkers. And we have an amazingly diverse state. So it's been remarkable to me that in every community, upstate and down, rural, urban, whatever the ethnicity, I've heard the same two themes over and over again. New Yorkers have lost confidence in our state's government 
and they have also lost confidence in a lot of the central institutions of our private sector, particularly in the area of financial services. And the governor and I have both experienced and remarked on the fact that when you talk to people around the state about Albany, they literally shake their heads. Well, reform is underway, but we still need your help. And I would urge you, as someone who really who comes from this community, uh, everyone in New York's business community has to understand that the loss of people's faith in the public sector hurts our private sector. And as we seek fundamental reforms in the institutions of our state's government, which we believe me, we are now doing in Albany, and uh, uh, I appreciate being referred to as the leading reformer in Albany, but I have to say Liz Kruger, uh, is, who is here with us today, is right, right up there when it comes to fighting the machinery. Uh, but as we seek fundamental reforms, let's all remember that we have to treat our democratic institutions with respect. In my view, the genius of America is the balance between our free markets, in which all are invited to become as successful as they can, and our electoral democracy in which no matter how poor you are, your vote counts as much as the most prosperous billionaires. There's no place in America where this brilliant combination of commerce and democracy has been more successful than in the great state of New York. The wonders that can be produced when an innovative forward-looking government and an innovative forward-looking business community work together are on display in our state. From the Erie Canal to the system of aquifers and tunnels around the watershed that provide the greatest metropolitan area in the world with fresh, unfiltered drinking water, the system of uh, our incredible mass transit system, which is unparalleled in the world in terms of the number of people it serves, the network of great public colleges and universities where my father could get a great free education at Brooklyn College, go to law school on the GI Bill, and come back to practice law, and then to give back and serve the community he and I love. So I believe it's crucial that as we focus on reform, we focus as believers in the unique and precious balance in our public and private sectors. And again, we have work to do restoring public confidence in both areas. As to the public sector, I'm going to try to help restore confidence, first by leading by example. Uh, one of the central goals of my office is to develop the most efficient and effective public law firm in the United States. For the first time, in the history of the Attorney General's office, I've hired a chief operating officer from the private sector, someone with a business and management consulting background who's focused on effectively managing our office and our resources and enabling us to do more with less as all of us in government must in this economy. I don't know if Rob Spire is here, but I actually stole her from him, and I'm eternally grateful for his public service in this area. Um, with the team that, that our COO has put together, we are taking the best management systems from the private sector, saving resources through consolidations, moving to division-based budgeting to provide more accountability, and we have revamped and redoubled our efforts to conduct timely and effective evaluations of all of our staff. All of this reflects a commitment to a targeted, data-driven management approach, which as we institutionalize these systems, will help us make smart and informed choices about how we spend the taxpayer's money. My effort to restore public confidence also includes a policy that is more subtle than, but ultimately as important as, important as our management changes. Every inquiry, investigation, and case we undertake in my office will be grounded in what I like to call evidence-based decision-making. This is based on the model of evidence-based practices, which I, I came, became familiar with in my several decades working in the criminal justice system. It's a simple idea, but you proceed, don't proceed without empirical evidence. You evaluate all the facts and follow them wherever they lead. It is amazing how many activists on every side of an issue demand that the state, which I represent now, take one position or another before we have all the information available to make a fully informed decision. What we've tried to bring to our office in our first 100 days is a balanced, thoughtful approach that gathers and follows the facts in order to make the best decisions. You may not always agree with what I do, but I don't think you'll be, ever be able to accuse me of not listening and not evaluating all the facts. For example, uh, we've addressed several important environmental issues in the last few months, and our focus is on the facts. On Indian Point, we sued the federal government for trying to change its regulations so they can store nuclear waste for extended periods of time up in Westchester County without undertaking 
the required review of public health, safety, and environmental hazards. And obviously, given the fact that the, the stored fuel at the nuclear reactor in Japan is what's causing most of their problems there, this is an issue we have to address because Indian Point has uh, uh, got 20 million people within a 50-mile radius. The same really goes for some of their uh, pro some of their federal government's approach to seismic risk and fire safety. Again, this is not a partisan issue. I'm going after my fellow Democrats, but we want a full review, and we want all the facts, and we want the public and their representatives to have them. Similarly, no matter where you stand on the issue of hydrofracking in the area around New York City's watershed, I hope we can all agree that we should evaluate its impact before rushing into something irreversible. That's why our office told the Delaware River Basin Commission, which covers the area around the watershed, that it has 30 days to commit to a full study of the health effects of this practice or will sue to force them to do it. What we're saying is we want all the facts so that our ultimate decisions are informed and thoughtful. We're demanding government action that is measured, evidence-based, and fair. Uh, on public corruption, we've already begun the process of rooting out bad actors, as Bill noted, I actually got started before I left the Senate when I chaired the committee uh, that expelled Senator Hiram Montserrat. And I'm proud to be joined here today by Dan Alonzo, who's now the chief assistant in the New York County District Attorney's Office, who was our counsel on that committee and uh, did incredible work. Um, we have expanded the activities in the AG's office of our Public Corruption Bureau. Uh, and for the first time in the history of the office, we're designating public corruption officers in every regional office which is essential because in many smaller counties and cities in the state, folks won't report public corruption because they perceive rightly or wrongly that the people they're reporting are close to the, the prosecutors or the authorities. That's not gonna be true anymore. They can always come to the Attorney General's office. Uh, this is not a matter for good government groups or editorial boards, ladies and gentlemen. Corruption costs money. Every taxpayer dollar that's stolen is another dollar that has to be found somewhere else or cut from services that New Yorkers need. And it's not just state dollars. Property taxes are driven up by Medicaid fraud and corrupt contractors. So I'm proud of the fact that as our first major initiative, we rolled out a fraud recovery effort to police the tens of billions of dollars our state and local governments lay out every year to private contractors. To do this, we have established a new taxpayer protection unit. Uh, this unit brings the focus that our Medicaid Fraud Recovery Unit, which uh, under Attorney General Cuomo uh, was an award-winning uh, fraud recovery unit, this brings the same focus to every other type of government contract. Anyone, whether it's a corrupt road contractor or waste hauler or people who deliver supplies to schools, is now going to be subject to the same intense level of scrutiny. Uh, the whole initiative will more than pay for itself and bring in far more in recoveries than it will cost to staff. So we're working hard, and I'm committed to restoring New Yorkers' faith in government. But as I mentioned, there's a similar crisis of confidence in the private sector that I hope all of you um, will really uh, help us with. I know firsthand that the lifeblood of American industry is trust. I'm actually the first attorney general in modern history who spent more of my career in the private sector than I have in public service. Uh, I actually served more than 15 years at Kirkpatrick and Lockhart and uh, in private practice representing major corporate clients, a few actually represented here today. And uh, last year as a state senator, I used my experience in this securities law to lead the fight against a crazy proposed change in our tax code that would have penalized hedge fund uh, private equity and venture capital managers who work in New York but live out of state, a proposal which would have driven people out of New York. Um, and uh, <laughs> As you probably recall, the Connecticut governor couldn't help but celebrate, uh, well, we shot down that proposal, so they had to go back to Hartford. Um, we're using the same common sense approach and bringing the same experience to bear in the Attorney General's office. But ladies and gentlemen, if you think the public has gotten over its anger and frustration about the crash and the bailout, you're mistaken. Campaigning, particularly in central and western New York, I met many, many people whose pension funds had lost their value, or fr whose friends or family were facing foreclosures, who feel like they went from a nation of savers to a nation of investors, and then found out they were in a rigged casino. We need to restore all of their confidence in our financial system. Investors, workers, and entrepreneurs have to believe that our laws will be enforced. They have to believe that contracts will be honored, 
and they have to believe that there's one set of rules for everyone. And I'm committed to restoring that confidence. This is especially important for New York because we are the home of the greatest entrepreneurs and the greatest financial markets in human history. We have to remain the home of financial innovation. Because of all this, I've requested and been given a seat on the eight-member working group to set up, it's, that has been set up by the National Association of Attorneys General to serve as the liaison between the new Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and all 50 attorneys general. As we work to set up a new, more effective regulatory regime, I want to ensure that New York has a seat at the table. Helping restore public confidence in the institutions of our private sector also requires us to work harder to make to make, ensure that our public sector focuses on making New York as competitive as it can possibly be in our global economy. I mean, in my view, again, the two have to work together. I recognize that the job of Attorney General uh, involves work as a regulator, whether it's over real estate finance or securities, and our job in those bureaus is not just to fight crime and fraud, but also to help the institutions we regulate that obey the law conduct their business easily and effectively. So in my staff orientations and meetings, I try to emphasize to everyone in our office that you don't just get points for catching bad guys, you also get points for helping the good guys. Uh, let me close with one critical area of my activities that I'm going to be expanding and one that I need all of you to help me with. In addition to the public and private sector, we have another great sector in New York that needs our help. My Charities Bureau has broad jurisdiction over New York's not-for-profit sector, which you all know is massive, and which, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is facing a looming crisis. In New York, our city, our finance and insurance institutions employ about 341,000 people. Our not-for-profits employ 500,000 people. Statewide, New York's not-for-profits employ about 17 or 18 percent of the state's workforce. And this is not just a matter of size. New York is home to the nation's best hospitals, cultural institutions, and the most dedicated and effective charitable and community-based organizations. I know the people in this room support and serve on the boards of many charitable groups. Many of you have valuable experience in this area. And that's why I'm asking for your help uh, to address the problems we're facing in this incredibly important sector. The economy may have bottomed out in many areas, but for New York's not-for-profits, the effects of cuts at every level of government have yet to be felt. And in this time of crisis, the laws, rules, and regulatory apparatus of our great state are frankly not up to the challenge. So today, I'm announcing, Bill asked me to announce something, so today I'm announcing the formation of a working group to develop proposals and recommend reforms to New York's laws governing not-for-profits, and I'm asking for you to join me in this effort. We need to revisit and revamp our laws and regulations. We need to revitalize and re-energize the sense of volunteerism, of giving back to our community through service on boards of New York's not-for-profits that has been a hallmark of our state and that, frankly, is not what it used to be. Let me give you a few examples of why we need to do this and why we need to do it now. New York's statutory requirements governing charities are so burdensome that several, and one publicly, one pu leading New York not-for-profit lawyer stated that it is essentially malpractice to advise a not-for-profit client to incorporate in New York. If a New York not-for-profit receives funding from six different city or state agencies, it can be subject to six separate audits and sets of reporting requirements. We require all charities with revenues over $250,000 to conduct full annual financial audits and file them with my office. This is completely out of line with other states. In California, the threshold is $2 million. We can be as tough or tougher in policing fraud without imposing unnecessary burdens. But ladies and gentlemen, in hard economic times, we can't afford to force our charitable organizations to spend 15 or 20 percent of their resources on compliance costs. A second aspect of what I view as a looming crisis is governance. This means that we need to recruit a new generation of leaders for charitable boards. We, and I mean all of you as well as my office, have to revitalize the sense of volunteerism through board service that has given New York such a magnificent array of charitable organizations. To do that, we need outreach, but we also need to clarify and streamline our laws and regulations so people are not confused about or afraid of 
what service on a board means. Our working group will include representatives of not-for-profits, government, and labor, but we need New York's corporate leadership to participate and, frankly, to play a leading role in this effort. Today, I ask for your help, and Bill, I will be following up tomorrow and next week and next month. Um, well, those are some of my thoughts on my focus and goals as your lawyer, as your attorney general, restoration of public confidence in the public and private sectors, and the revitalization and reform of New York's wonderful and critical not-for-profit sector. I know that this is just the beginning of what I hope will be a long and fruitful dialogue, and again, I sincerely thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this conversation. All right. Eric, we look forward to having that, continuing that dialogue and uh, your idea uh, that you present today in terms of the non-profits uh, is a fantastic uh, concept and we look forward to working with you specifically on that. Um, thank you for all joining this morning. At your table uh, is a flyer uh, for a preview screening of an incredible documentary <coughs> about an organization we've been supporting called New York. Uh, says thank you, and it's uh, the story of a young boy's idea uh, that he passed on to his father about how we as New Yorkers could pay back uh, all the great uh, support and love and uh, uh, help that we received after 9-11. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you, Eric, and uh, we'll see you next week.